<laughs> Welcome everyone to Spokane City Council briefing session. I'm Lori Kinnear, City Council President, who is partially blind today. So I have sunglasses. I apologize for um, got my two wing people here that are going to help me through this because uh, mostly I cannot see much of anything. So thank you for your understanding. And, and um, Abby, who did you say I look like? Weekend at Bernie's or? Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Appreciate that. So never a dull moment in the council office. So we're going to start with, uh, do you want to start with roll call? Council President Kinnear. I'm present. Council Member Bingle. He's right I see there. him online. Yeah. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Ulrich. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Zappone. Here. And Council Member Bingle, one more time. Thank you. Now I can hear. Okay. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. We're going to start with the uh, today's agenda. We have a few things that we need to substitute. And um, Mr. Jones, so the first one is. Yep, for an, an item, item number six under consent, looking for a request, a motion to substitute the following item with an updated revised version filed on the 19th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then we need to, I you need to read it, Terry, the substituted version or no? Um, I'll read it when I read the consent okay. agenda. Okay. Then we need to go on to the next one. All right. So n number nine, I don't, That's right. Jacob, but we don't need to vote on that though. It's just substituting no. the, the hearing, mm -hmm. correct? All right. Uh, moving into the number 10, we need a request to mo a motion to suspend council rules and add the following items. First one is OPR 2023-1096. I don't know if you want to do all these separately. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to suspend the rules for the purposes of adding items 10, 11, and 12. Okay, okay. thank you. Second. Right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 You opposed? All right. Uh, we've got the rules suspended. Um, now we need to add the items. Uh, I will make a motion that we add 10, 11, and 12 to our consent agenda. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And would you like any staff briefing on those three items? or Does anyone want staff briefing on those three items? I, I had another follow-up question on 11, the ammunition. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, I just want uh, a question again about the mitigation of the lead to see if there's like any preventative. Oh, um, Mr. Uh, He's here. Officer Briggs is here. So this is just a follow-up, a clarifying question from earlier about the lead. So you're saying every few years you go and clean it and the cost to do it, but are there mitigation efforts from it like leaking into the aquifer or that type of, like is there plastic? Um, so the barrier itself is um, mostly sand and then it's, it's a fairly significant way from the river. Um, it's uh, been in that location for a long time and I know one of the things they do when they mine it is to look at all of those things. It stays in a fairly truncated um, area when, when that lead accumulates, it, it really is, it doesn't spread out, it, it stays in a localized area. So. Oh, Thank you. Go ahead. I like some briefing on uh, number 12. Same. Can you tell me what it is? I just like clarity on the NOFA that was written. Perfect. Yep, we have Kim here. Okay. Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members, Kim McCollum, Department of Housing and, sorry, <laughs> Department of um, Neighborhood Housing and Human Services. Sorry about that. And you have a question, Council Member Wilkerson. So it specifically speaks to matching funds. Is there matching funds available when we submit this? And I didn't see any particular data on outcomes that should have been included with this uh, proposal. The outcomes often comes from the contracts from the Department of Commerce. 
but um, they would probably stay very similar to the outcomes that we would normally use in our normal contracts as well if we were to, to put any of those in. Um, in regards to the, I, I'm sorry, your first question? Well, it was about the match. Will the, oh, the match, yes. can be participating right. in the three to one match yes. based on this? There has, Nicolette has been talking to the providers as well about the 1590 as a match for the three to one on the beds, we've actually submitted today, Eric Finch has been working on their proposal, so he's submitted several questions today that all of the members of the row providers had today. One of them was the question for more clarity on the three to one, because if you have a three to one match, it'll, it, they have different categories where there's eight million roughly for that if there's three to one match. When we talked to the state before, it sounded like that wasn't like firm, so we're trying to get firmed up on that. There are match in regards to continuum of care funding, and often the stakeholders will also have their own match of 25%. So we're still working a little bit on that on that side. Go ahead. So should we hold off on voting for this today if we're still waiting for information? Well, we'll have the we should hopefully we'll have the information I can share by in the morning. We'll add that in once we have the it's due on the 25th of October. Oh, okay, so, so we don't have, have a lot of time. yes, and okay. this is the request just to be able to um, have approval to submit that proposal. Okay, thanks. Yes, Councilman Councilman or Cathcart. Yeah, I, so I know there was a meeting earlier today to talk about some of this stuff, and I don't know if there were any changes as a result of that. But I do, I do have a number of concerns and questions over what's in here. I mean, in particular, some of the costs. Uh, I think one of the proposals is a 66,000 per bed cost, which just seems extraordinarily high, and that number could actually jump to 80 if the numbers don't pan out. Um, there's also uh, a proposal for tiny homes, but doesn't say where those are going, what code those are following. We still have yet to have our tiny lot development code produced by the plan uh, commission, so I'm just curious on that. And, uh, and then also the idea of 20 low barrier shelter beds uh, in the basement of the way out shelter, which is something that uh, at least a couple of us on this council have been pretty vocal about going back quite a while. And to see that return kind of brings up a whole lot of history. So I'm just kind of curious. Thank you. So in regards to the, the tiny home location, we'll start with that one. Um, that we received an update in our conversation this morning that they do have a location, but they're not disclosing that location at this time. So they, but they do have a location, so. Do we know if it's in a neighborhood, a business center, I, in the city, out the city? I do not know on that, although I will, um, I've expressed this before, once we would have that location, we would make sure we really connected with the neighborhoods, being part of the neighborhood services as well. I've talked to my team about the fact that once we have any location, mm -hmm. even to, to talk on the way out shelter, if there was going to be new beds in that lower level, that we would definitely, start as quickly as possible to be able to work with the neighborhoods on those situations. But I don't know where the location is. We did ask that today and that's still, um, I think the whole point is waiting until they have some funding and then maybe there may be some other paperwork that they're still working on that they did not want to dis disclose where that was yet. Well, I just think if we're gonna pass money along, we should have some details before we make those decisions. And I can pass that along as well. As far as the way out um, shelter, I did have a conversation because that question was brought up this morning about the low barrier. I think one thing, and, and we kind of went back and forth. I mean, we can talk about whether there would be some that would be able to have be low barrier. But I think one thing to remember about this whole plan is that transitional housing, the, the whole plan is to move anyone that has not, that's been badged or row um, initiatives, we're still trying to figure out which one of those, there's a difference of opinion on kind of from the state on whether it's just starting with the badged and then going to row, that's kind of how we've heard it. But um, going from not being sheltered into a shelter, but then the most important part is taking folks that are in shelters right now that have been, have been badged are those that in the row initiative, the row have been receiving row assessments, moving them from shelter into transitional into permanent. So the point of, of the Salvation Army, and this was just one idea that the city had thrown out, was because they have um, high success rate but also the low barrier would be because they're more transitional. They, has, they have phase two and phase three, 
but it would be more of a transitional housing which does not have to be low barrier. So there may be some badged individuals that could be able to be in a in a environment that is you know that wouldn't be low barrier but my understanding is this is limited only to those who are badged or were a part of the row yes, that's correct and so 20 beds maybe we what how we looked at this was we took everyone's all the stakeholders ideas put them all in together because as all of you know from the projects in the past the rose projects a lot was submitted and some was taken, some was not, so we wanted to make sure we had a, a lot of different between mainly permanent housing because that's when we've had our conversations with the state. That's what's been most important is finding that quick turnaround, though, for permanent housing by April of 2024 is, is a difficult task, as we heard this morning from the stakeholders. But again, I'll just reiterate, I mean, we, this is an argument we had ad nauseum a year or two years ago, mixing populations like that does nobody any good. It sets people backwards. It doesn't help people progress. And you know, there are a lot of people who are doing really well in that transitional yes. housing and to introduce a new population that are low barrier, I think would disrupt the entire thing. And frankly, we're not hearing neighborhood concerns anymore. Those no, went you're, away you're correct. When the low barrier shelter went away yes. and to reintroduce that and create that situation again, I just don't think makes any sense at all. I, I agree with you because I think that would have to be transitional versus an emergency <clears throat> low barrier situation. But the problem is we're voting on that today. So we're just voting, no, on, we're the, voting on the application. On the application. The, yeah, yes, so just it. yes, not the how. And then it's once the, the, the state will review everything that we've proposed, they will come back with what they choose to do and what they do not choose to do. And then of course, then that's when we would bring that back. We do not know the timing yet. We've asked how quickly, because one of the issues is from the stakeholders today is we can't plan a full year of rapid rehousing, rapid rehousing if we only have, let's say we didn't get everything completed, the contract started in February. That's only five months to complete what they were hoping to do. All of the beds have to be in place by April of 2024. So we still don't really have that quite that final from the state on like when will this be available? Hope Council, that answered. Councilmember yes. Bingle and then Councilmember Orrich. I said your name correctly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't feel comfortable voting for something where somebody doesn't want to tell us a location. I can understand and why they wouldn't want to tell us a location and that's totally within their prerogative. But I don't feel comfortable voting on something like that. Um, if you tell me right and we can guarantee that at some point we can still shut that down in a in a future meeting. I'm in voting on it, but I'm pretty uncomfortable on, on a number of issues here on this vote today. And I understand the agency and why we have to get it done because we have a deadline. But I'm incredibly frustrated that somebody wouldn't tell us a location um, because I'm certainly not voting to put anything more in District 1. And uh, if that's um, where they're going to be doing it, it's a hard no for me. And so whatever it is to know that location before I'm voting on anything. Um, even if it is a good idea, if I don't have all the information, I'm not voting for it. Or if I have to vote for it, I'm okay. Thank you. Uh, two questions for you, Kim. First, with the projects submitted in the application, do you get to prioritize any of them or you just submit all of them and then Commerce gets to decide what they fund? We asked um, the stakeholders today to prioritize how they, Eric Finch has been doing the application, I may not have said that. And so he developed a scorecard sort of like in regards to how many, num how many units, how much was the cost per unit, all of those. And then what we had hoped for um, that maybe everyone would send that back to us. But we had really good discussion today. So that sort of got, that timing didn't quite happen. So. We will probably find, obviously, we'll prioritize all the permanent housing first, transitional second, and then there are a few other outreach uh, requests that have been in there, and those will go in third. And this will go out to everyone, hopefully, by late afternoon tomorrow, so everybody can take a look at it. And if you feel that maybe there's a difference in the priority, we can always do a fast conversation and see if and we can change that up. One more question for you. So this is due Wednesday, so I understand the time when, crunch. Wednesday, yes. What, it would have been great if we just had more time, especially now seeing the projects. What can we change in the future to make sure more time happens here? Well, we started really, we started about, well, we've, we found out about September 11th. 
we had a few conversations with the county first because there's that it was the county was the represented priority county and so after we got done with that about the 4th of october is when we had our stakeholder uh no the october 4th i'm sorry was when we had the final community uh county uh conversation the ninth is when we had all the row folks come together and then from there we waited we needed to wait a little while till nathan pippen came back from the state he's the one that works with the city of spokane and the county so we had a state conversation on the 18th we had the stakeholders on the date of the 9th had really provided us a lot of really good questions, which we had sent up to Commerce. We had not received those back until Nathan got back. So there was some, there was some delay on our part. There was some delay on, on uh, the Commerce part. So then the conversation today, um, we had, Eric did ask to see if we could have the application in on Friday versus Wednesday. We had not, we've not heard back, so we're aiming for Wednesday. I will say this though, this was one of the conversations in our first row conversation, and everyone really agreed. The 2025 part of this initiative, there's a loss of like $8 million. So our real look is how do we take, how do we start in January and really look at what the priority is going to be for that 2025 stream versus, I mean, some of them will always be, you know, Catalyst is, will be funded and, and the VOA's housing will be funded. But there's going to be in that loss of money there, we all want to really get together and really talk about how many, how many folks are still badged, how, how many are living on, and maybe still in the right of way, and go from there in regards to really planning. So that is on our, on our, our plan for, we may start before January, but sometimes January is just because, again, holiday season isn't always easy to get everybody. So we'll have more of a chance to um, ask questions when this comes up in our ledge session a right. little later. So, Kim, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. And I'm going to have Mr. Jones go through the consent agenda for next Council week. Council President. I Council Member Bingle. Do we know if, do we know if we're going to be able to um, vote on the proposals later on. That's a, a key piece of information for me. I really need to know before we take this vote today. I don't understand your question. We just Kim. talked about that. I know, but what is he asking? So the idea was that today we're voting on something for the ability to apply for something, but that all those projects have to come back to us yes. for approval. Yes. Is right. that yes. accurate? Yes. 100% for tour. Yes. Yeah. Just There's conflicting no answers there. So, Council? Yes, go ahead. I, I understood it has to be submitted by the 25th. Yes. So, we will be voting tonight. It will not have the opportunity to come back before us based on the date that Kim just shared. I think he was talking about the details tonight? of it coming oh, back. Oh, the to details us. will come back. So, right. just clarity. This is just the approval to apply for a grant. Yes. Absolutely no guarantee that we're going to get a dime. Correct. of this money, but we need to make the effort Correct. because we don't have the resources ourselves. Correct. So. And we'll have a list of priorities. Absolutely. We'll look at. Okay. Council and I, and I get that. And if we get the money, then do we still have the ability to say, no, we're not funding this project? Will we be able to do it project by project or it will just this proposal is in and then it's a yes vote up or down for the entire project? So Kim's coming back again. And this is a yes or no, Kim. Yes or no. Um, <laughs> Commerce's contract will be all of the projects at once. So I will, hmm, I, because they wouldn't, no, wait, let's back up. If those, the 3.2 or the four mil contracts will be done through the city of Spokane, if that's the choice. And at that time, we might be able to separate each one of those out. I, right. I would have to look at legal and see whether, okay. how that, because so, we would, we would at, come to you to accept the money, which would be the 3.2. I'm sorry, I'm thinking out loud here. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but um, at that time, each contract will be different because each contract would have a different provider. So at that time, if, 
Yes. Yes. Her you answer will look, is yes. You will have a chance to look at all of that one by one is how I would assume it would be. Does that help? Does that help you? Go ahead. Well, not really. I need to know, will we have to just vote yes for all of the projects or will we be able to individually approve the projects? Using the continuum of care, well, I wish I had enough experience to, to say firmly on that, Council Member. I'm, uh, I would, I don't know. Can we not make that request as a council? I would think you could request each one of those con contracts to be submitted yeah. separately. Yeah, that's, that's what I would what I'm say, thinking, Council Member Bingo. Is we, as a council, if you want us to vote on something and approve it, then our terms are each one separately. Yeah. And we can do that. I, I would feel comfortable or more comfortable with that, considering, again, if somebody's not going to tell me a location of a project, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a hard no on that. Yeah. Um, and so that's my only request. Yeah, and I think you, I won't be here, but you all can mandate that you want it separate. You want to know the details and you want each one of them separate. Because we'll do those, obviously we do each one of those contracts separately. Yes. And still have to bring them forth for the amount, so. Yes. Does that help you? Yeah. Council Member Bingo. And Council President, there's no guarantee what the right-of-way funding will fund. No. So we have a no. priority list. That's right. Yes. We do not know what they will fund. So it will depend on what they fund. And yes, we would have the ability to accept that money or to send it back. That's right. That's right. Yes. Does that help you? Oh, no. Another one. Okay. Okay. So just to be clear, because if Commerce approves funding for this, I'm assuming they won't say, hey, we don't want this one. Can we take this money and put it somewhere else? So it would be an accept or rejection of the funds based on the projects then. There will be discussions before, in the past, there was discussions of which projects would be accepted and which ones would not, were not accepted. I wasn't involved in those discussions, so I'm not sure, but um, I would think that at that time, if they were to choose one that we would, once we have, let me just put it this way, sorry, thinking out loud. If we got, once we have Department of Commerce's key list of proposals for that amount of money, we will share that. And I would assume we would have discussions about that. So that's, from there, I don't know what else to say. Sorry. Go Kim, ahead. Could, you, could you just clarify, you mentioned earlier to, uh, uh, working out additional details tomorrow. If we vote today, how can you work out any further details tomorrow? It's locked in well, when we vote. No, because today's is just the request to so submit a proposal. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen the proposal yet. So tomorrow the proposal will be, I mean, it's, it, it will be completed mm -hmm. and it will go out in regards mm -hmm. to that. This is just if to say whether or not we can submit that proposal. And if, if the council were to decide, I mean, this can go, if the city doesn't take over on doing this proposal, it will go back to either one of the nonprofits or another local government. So you have that choice as well. I mean, we, if, if it doesn't feel right for the city to do that, then the state would work once again with those, those other providers and distribute the money. Could, could we have not, uh, uh attempted to apply these dollars, apply for these dollars to have them allocated to the regional effort? We actually, um, that was a, that, that was a question and they, and we asked the state that 20% of the amount of the 3.2 and the reason why that's different than the 3.4 is just how it subtracts out. I won't go into that, but it was like $660,000 could have gone to the Regional Homeless Authority as long as they could have a project. It couldn't go for like setting up the, you know, the, the staff or any right. of that. They would have to have a project ready to go by um, April of 2024. So I went and talked with Gavin and Rick and they were unsure, pretty sure that that was not, may not be able to be, they were uncomfortable with maybe taking the money away when they weren't sure. But that 2025 piece, uh, we would definitely have them involved in that conversation okay. because they're, by then they'll have 
you know, even maybe before that, some of this may actually go into that authority. Councilmember Bingle. Okay, so my one, again, just request would be that we set the conditions that we can accept or reject the individual projects, which does not mean I'm interested or looking at any particular project to reject. I just want to know where it is and what we're spending the money on before we approve anything. So please make the conditions that we approve them individually. Are you speaking to Kim or to us? Oh, I thought that's what you told me was that we put those stipulations yes, on. Yes, I mean, when the time comes, that's what you can do. You don't even know if you have the grant yet. You, what we're doing is we're giving her, giving that department permission to apply. We do this with police, we do this with all our departments. These grants come before us and we say, yes, please go apply, without knowing nearly all the questions you have all asked today, because th those answers come later. Right now we're just, you get permission to apply for the grant. So then what you're saying to me is that this process and not us, I thought you were gonna get part of the grant stipulations, and no. so that's why I might have misunderstood. No, no, not yet. You don't even, I mean, you we don't know that's that we're why. gonna get it. So we're just saying, Kim, go ahead, apply for the grant, that's all. All right, okay. um, Terry, have we actually voted to add these? We voted to suspend the rules. Yes. We did. Mm -hmm. We did. Add. All right. Let's move on. All right, moving on, on to October 30th, advanced agenda going into the consent items. Uh, number one and two, we'll start with a briefing from Rick Giddings on those two items. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, first item is a pre approval to purchase a Ford. F-150 Lightning for the uh, engineering, uh, engineering department. It's an all-electric all pickup. Uh, originally, this was just going to be a pre-approval, but we've located a pickup uh, at Bud Clary, which means it'll go through the DES contract, most likely. Uh, total cost not to exceed $60,000. Any questions on that one? And the, the next two items, towing contracts, uh, we issued an RFP for towing uh, with the intent of of, uh, uh, of awarding primary and secondary contracts for towing. Having a couple of contracts allows us to choose a vendor that can give us the, the fastest and best service for any given uh, situation. Highest scoring respondent was Evergreen State Towing. Uh, they will be awarded the primary contract of $65,000 and a uh, close second was Reliable Towing, uh, whose contract will be $10,000. Any questions on those? Right, thank you. Right. Thank you, Rick. Number three is the uh, Spokane Airport Board 2024 budget, and this will be presented by Larry Crowder. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, good afternoon, Council President, members of Council, Larry Crowder. I'm joined with, by Rob Schultz, our CFO. We have a short PowerPoint. I promise we won't take too long to run through that. Uh, most of you have uh, seen budget presentations before, but I'm always happy, and Rob is happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Larry, and good afternoon, Council President, members of City Council. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about our budget for the airport. Uh, as Larry said, we have a short PowerPoint presentation. If there's any questions as I go through this information, please feel free to interrupt, um, and we'll be able to answer those questions at that time. So uh, starting off, what we wanted to mention to City Council is that uh, with this budget re uh, re uh, approval request, uh, we are not asking for any funds from city uh, for. I do want everybody to continue to pay attention to this, though, because uh, we are some really exciting things going on at the airport right now. Uh, so one of the key components of airports is really uh, to be financially self-sufficient. Uh, and that it continues in 24 based on this budget. Funds uh, come from only system users, uh, do not come from uh, taxpayer dollars uh, for that. I won't go through all of the information on this slide. Uh, there's a lot of information in terms of operating revenues as well as how we fund capital at the airport. Uh, I will just say that uh, some of those operating revenues we have up here are some of the major uh, components or revenue drivers at the airport for us. And then the capital programs, we'll get into a little bit more detail about that uh, here in just a few minutes. Uh, 
but there are some grant programs that we have as well as uh, some uh, passenger facility charges, customer facility charges that go to very specific uses at the airport. We'll cover that in about two slides just with a little bit more information uh, about those funding sources. So one of the things I wanted to, this uh, is a graph of a six year picture of uh, passengers as well as landed weight at the airport. Those are really key components uh, for us in terms of metrics that we look at at the airport. And wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about our assumptions going into 2024. On the left hand side is our passengers and that's really a key metric for us because it drives a certain amount of revenue as well as the demand from airlines uh, for the airport. The right hand sa side is our landed weight, uh, that's, which is another major revenue driver for us uh, at the airport. Uh, 2019 was our record year uh, in terms of passenger activity. Uh, we are <coughs> trending uh, toward exceeding that. Uh, we hope we will hang on for the next two and a half months uh, on those numbers, uh, but we are trending in the right direction in terms of uh, full recovery and potentially exceeding 2019 numbers. Obviously not final yet uh, on there, but we are trending in that direction. For 2024, what we wanted to do, there's a lot of economic factors out there that people hear of in terms of uh, high interest rates right now, uh, you have higher inflation what the Fed has, but it's being offset a little bit by consumer spending as well as a strong job market. And so what we wanted to do is just be a little conservative with our budget for 24 in terms of the main assumptions that we have. And so we kept our passengers really the same as what we're forecasting for 23. Uh, so just really a, a flat uh, in terms of that component of it. On the landed weight uh, component of it, uh, again, the main assumption there is we uh, really flat in terms of our landed weight for 24 versus 23. Just a slight increase in terms of the cargo activity, which we continue to see a little bit more cargo activity uh, between UPS, FedEx, and Prime Air uh, at the airport. So there's two assumptions that will drive some components throughout our budget process uh, for that. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a little bit hard to read up there. Uh, I will make that bigger next year when we come back. But this graph, really what it shows is really the ins and outs of the airport and how we fund stuff. So on the right hand side of that chart you're looking at in terms of operating revenue and expenses, the revenues are our outflows uh, on there, greens are the inflows. And so those are the different funding sources we have uh, for that. What that ends up leading to is uh, our discretionary cash that we have, some of that will go to match some federal grants that we have uh, at the airport. Other components will then go to help uh, maintain our operating reserves at the airport as well as fund capital programs, which we'll get into in just the next couple slides. On the left hand side is our non-operating uh, revenue components that we have. Those are grants as well as a passenger facility charge and customer facility charge. Those can't be used for operating expenditures, they can only be used for very specific purposes in terms of capital program. Uh, that helps some, uh, fund some of the capital for the airport uh, for 2024. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So these are the highlights that we have uh, in terms of our budget uh, for 2024. We have consolidated operating revenue, uh, 57.3 million. Uh, it's about a 13% increase uh, from 2023. Part of that is gonna be uh, what we call our rates and charges or what we uh, charge to the airlines uh, for operating at the airport. There's another component uh, of that which is, relates to parking at the airport. Uh, so we are proposing a rate increase uh, for our garage and outside lots uh, at the airport, uh, but no change to our economy or the shuttle lots that we have at the airport. Uh, and that increase will go to help uh, the demand management at the airport. Uh, just today, for instance, uh, in, uh, in October on a Monday, we had to close the garage because of capacity. Uh, and so we want that to help sort of um, manage that demand that we have at the airport for garage and outside uh, capacity. Other thing that we'll do is also help fund uh, debt service as well as our capital program uh, for 2024. For operating expenditures, we have a budget of 42 million. Uh, and that's about a 5.4% increase uh, from the 23 budget. A lot of that relates to uh, some staffing vacancies that we have uh, and trying to staff up for the passenger level activity that we have as well as our capital program. On the bottom part is our capital improvement program. Uh, as I will get into in a couple slides, we are requesting uh, 133.3 million uh, or approval of that for our 24 budget. The items on there would just hit real on a high level, 57 million that comes from federal grants uh, through different programs from FAA, the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as other funding sources that we have. 
We likely will do a debt issuance in 24 to help fund Concourse C Trex. This has always been in the works for us, uh, but it's been delayed a little bit because of some sex with uh, federal grants that we have received um, over the last couple of years. But we anticipate somewhere in the late summer, early fall, that we will do a debt issuance uh, of that. The debt issuance will be more for, than 28 million, but again, 28 million is just what we're asking for for 2024 uh, funds. And then uh, up to 48. Um, 0.1 million of airport funds for our capital program. So just a little bit of detail on our capital programs uh, for uh, 2024. Uh, PFC PAYGO, uh, basically what PAYGO is just pay as you go, so it's a cash. Uh, so collection of that passenger facility charge will go to help fund some of the Concourse C trek, so that uh, expansion we're doing on Concourse C. It'll also help fund a taxi lane and ramp project that we have going out there. Uh, I mentioned the debt issuance already. We also are improving some rental car facility areas, uh, phase three of that program that we will use uh, some customer facility charge funds for. Uh, and then we have federal grants for the West Terminal Ramp Project that goes really aligned uh, with that expansion of Concourse C. And then airport funds to do things such as parking capacity, some terminal improvements. Uh, we have other things in terms of infrastructure needs, uh, modernizing the fuel facility, and some of those other items that are really key for uh, running the airport efficiently. Uh, so uh, two slides to go, and this one is the 2024 budget highlights. And so this really talks about a couple of the major components that we look at in terms of funding sources. So the first one is the rate summary. What the rate summary does is looks at what we are charging the airlines in the terminal rent uh, area. And so this is for rental space uh, at the airport itself. We have two classes, class one, class two. Class one is really what you will call the customer facing one. So it's ticket counters, it's the gate uh, areas, the hold rooms on there. So it's a 4.9% increase over 23 rates. So up to $66.11 per square foot per annum. And then our landing fee uh, will increase from $2.24 up to $2.35. to also a 4.9% increase uh, for those rates in 24. And then finally, the last component, it's not really a rate, uh, but it's, I think it's just worth calling out, uh, is a, what we call a cost per employment, or CPE. That's really a metric that airport uses uh, to sort of measure uh, the cost competitiveness, if you will, amongst other airports. Uh, we have a proposed rate of $6.32 for 2024. That is a very competitive uh, rate among similar sized airports, and it's in the lowest quartile of U.S. airports, and it really goes to the management of the airport overall and how we're funding uh, not just our operating expenditures, but capital program as well. So in conclusion, uh, this is the budget summary for 2024. Operating expenses on the lower left-hand side, uh, we are uh, seeking approval, uh, 51. $1,594,945 in operating expenditures. And in capital budget, uh, it's a total of $133,288,000 uh, for a capital program. So a total budget, consolidated budget, both operating and capital. Uh, we are uh, seeking approval of $184,882,945. That is the last slide. Um, and I will take any questions that members have. Also just wanted to say before those questions that uh, we appreciate all the support we get from not just city council, but also uh, city staff members as well throughout the year. Uh, and Jen, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this to you today. Thank you. Are there questions? Go ahead. Not so much on the budget. When is uh, Concourse C scheduled to be completed? There are two, there's a couple of phases to that, uh, Council Member Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. So the first one is going to be the extension we're doing right now, which is the West expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipate quarter two of 2024 uh, for that to be open. And then what we'll do is we'll start the east part of that, which is uh, d uh, demoing the, uh, the ground load area that we have there, and we will make that a passenger boarding bridge level as well. And then we'll renovate the existing, what we call upper C uh, concourse mm -hmm. right now. And that should be um, quarter three of 2025. So we are making very great progress on that. If you've been out there at all lately, uh, really a lot of construction, not just there, but in other parts of the airport as well. Any other questions? Thank you so much. We appreciate all that you do. And Larry, great job. Thank you so much. Council President, thank you, Council. As Rob said, we just really appreciate the teamwork and the partnership we have with our Council. Um, and uh, I think that 
uh, as Rob said, with 2024, um, uh, we're really taking a very conservative outlook. There certainly could be some headwinds in the economy, and we want to be very, you know, very conservative in terms of what we see. Uh, but uh, this year, I think we'll, we'll have finish strong, probably about 4% over 2019. Uh, but again, uh, very, very conservative uh, in the outlook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, number four and five, uh, Matt Boston will be briefing us on setting some hearings. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So this is uh, very quick. This is uh, required by RCW. Uh, this is re this is the requirement setting the budget hearing for uh, the adoption of the 2024 budget. Uh, those hearings are going to be on 1113 and 1120. And then uh, item number five is setting the budget hearing for the adoption, or I'm sorry, setting the CIP uh, hearing for the adoption of the six year CIP on, 11, uh, on November 6th. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Moving on, number six, assistance awards in accordance with the approved tranche three of ARPA allocations will be briefed by Michelle Murray. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you very much. Um, on August uh, 8th, 2022, the City Council approved tranche three of ARPA allocations allocating $5 million to small business entities inside the city limits. Round two opened on May 24th, 2023, and the city awarded 31 organizations on 9 11, 2023, a total of 1.5. $1.037 million uh, eligible applications. We then, we kept those applications open from May to August, and since it was th such a long uh, application period, we broke it up into two pieces, awarded what we had on 9-11, and this is the second half finishing out the round uh, for a total of uh, $1.403 million in this round, or second half of this round. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. You. Appreciate it. Uh, number seven and number eight are two consultant agreements. This will be briefed by Dan Buller. Good afternoon. Item seven and eight are the proposed contracts with Kaufman Engineers for on-call surveying services for two hundred fifty thousand, and with Westland Resources for on-call historic resource services for three hundred thousand, both for a two-year contract with an optional third-year renewal. These firms were selected via a request for qualifications process as required by state law. These two contracts are paid by the various public works construction contracts for which they will be used. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right, that concludes the consent agenda. Now moving into the legislative agenda and the, and the special budget ordinances. There is one. SBO Ordinance C36453 of miscellaneous grant funds, and this will be briefed by Sarah Thompson. Good afternoon. Sarah Thompson with Municipal Court and here for our DUI court program. So our DUI court was awarded $200,000 from the Traffic Safety Commission to assist with all the funding that we need. We have allocated $118,000 to drug and alcohol testing, $14,500 towards transportation services, which tend to be the bus passes, $2,500 for community engagement. That's gonna help us support our town hall in December, which you'll all receive a save the date here shortly, but we honor the, and we recognize the National Impaired Driving Awareness and Prevention Month. And we also hope to branch out into the community and have more of a pro proactive approach. Uh, we will also help with interlock assistance in the amount of $30,000 for those who have been deemed indigent in our program, and then the evaluation services in the amount of $35,000. So any questions? Yeah, thank you. I was just uh, wondering about the bus passes. Mm -hmm. So that's purchased through STA? Yes. Uh, is that full rate, like $2, or is it a community access pass? Is so, that $1? How does that work? Correct. So we've partnered with some nonprofits so that we do get the 50% off rate. You do. Mm -hmm. uh, and how useful do you find this part of the program, I guess? And I'm sorry? Be, how useful is this part of the program, and would it be different if they were unlimited passes? <laughs> if, there more, if you didn't have to purchase it at the 50% rate, but you could just give out as many as you wanted, would that change how you use that? No, I think in our DUI court pro program, they are 
very beneficial. We have participants that use like 30 day passes. So we've switched to connect cards. Uh, so those day passes or seven day passes aren't sufficient because they can't drive. So I think that we have the funding to support what we need for DUI court. However, if you talk about the other courts, we are, we are lacking because transportation is a barrier all across our therapeutic programs. So you could use more. We could use more. Okay. DUI that's, court's covered. That's a better way to ask. <laughs> Sorry. Poor question. No, you're good. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah. All right, thank you. It. Now moving into resolutions, we have resolution 2023-0089 and 0098. This was a deferral of two weeks of our City of Spokane Retail Water Service area. Um, Eldon's here if there's any additional questions. I do believe there's also a meeting scheduled later this week. All right, good on there. And then we have a resolution 2023-0093 with the accompanying ordinance declaring the clean energy. And this will be briefed by Rick Giddings. Uh, so this resolution OPR are uh, a sole source declaration and contract with Clean Energy Corporation uh, for the repair and maintenance of our uh, renewable natural gas fueling site. Clean Energy has been maintaining the site since it was built in 2015. Um, they are actually the only authorized provider of parts and service for the IMW compressors that are ins installed at the site, thus the, the sole source. Um, as you may remember, we added a fuel site technician that was going to help save some money off of this contract uh, because that person can do some of the more day-to-day uh, -day maintenance on this. We were able to negotiate a reduced service uh, schedule uh, and uh, it still provides all the maintenance that we need, preventive maintenance that we need uh, and the emergency service, but um, saves the city about 30% over what it would have been on the previous contract. Uh, based on the quantity of fuel we're currently using at the site, 350,000 gallon equivalents of, of renewable natural gas or compressed natural gas. Uh, the first year should only be about $160,000 in, in expenditures, but because we've got more CNG garbage trucks coming, we, we know that we're going to be using more. And so we've built in a little wiggle room to this contract uh, not to exceed $250,000 per year. Uh, it's a one-year contract with the option of four additional renewals. Any questions on that? All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Rick. Now moving into the first reading ordinances. Uh, the first one is C36454 relating to the waiver of certain permitting fees for solar energy systems, and this will be briefed by Tammy Palmquist. Good afternoon. Um, so this was briefed earlier in the spring, uh, came to a couple committees and uh, talked to everybody about it. Um, one thing I wanted to update is in the solar permit fees, when I turned this in a couple weeks ago, we were at 435, now we're at 544, 554 permits for the year to date. So still a little bit less than last year, but still a substantial amount of permits for our staff to be reviewing and inspecting um, without getting payment for those. So this also aligns with, you know, the budget of making sure that we're providing cost of service recovery. Um, and so Lance is also here from the fire department because it plays into their department as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to expand on is that we, uh, Councilman Cathcart and I met with a solar company, Lumio, and they talked a lot about, hey, it would be great if the city was looking into Solar App Plus, which is a national um, application that people can apply to, we're already doing that. We have that teed up and ready to go for our IT department to help integrate that into our permitting system. Hopefully in the next couple months we can get that work done. That means that they, the solar companies would apply through Solar App Plus and only be charged a $25 review fee. Um, all of that work would be done by Solar App Plus. They then apply for our permit they don't pay our review fee because that review has already been done and approved, um, and then they would just get the inspection through the city. So it would streamline the permitting process once they applied with that approval from Solar App Plus. It's an instantaneous permit, so there's no additional review, no additional waiting time. I think it'll be really great. We've had a few meetings with Lumio after that to be like, hey, what's your experience in other jurisdictions? How is this working? How can we implement it correctly from the beginning? so that we're not fumbling um, to get through it. They've been super helpful 
and just provided us with a lot of information and things that we didn't quite think about. So that's been really great. Um, so we are looking to then strike the fee waiver in both of the solar and the EV charging station and implement a minimal fee to, to capture um, our staff time. Any questions for Lance or I? Council Member Bingle, do you have a question? I don't have a question, but just a, a quick note, if I could. Sure. Um, I believe that our um, ordinance says that until our renewable energy is 50% or more of the production in the city of Spokane. And um, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, based on uh, the state commerce department's numbers that we're well above that number. Um, and so anyway, I think that we're, we're actually out of compliance with our current code as it stands. Um, but uh, I, I do have a question. I guess I'll, I'll follow up with Kelly on this as well. If this is something that we're wanting to do, maybe we can find a funding source from the state as they have a ton of cap and trade dollars that they're gonna be looking to use. And maybe this would be a program that they'd wanna fund rather than the city funding it if we're wanting to keep waiving fees. Thank you. All right, okay. perfect. Thank, Thank you, you, Tammy. Next ordinance is C36455 relating to the adopting a six-year capital improvement program, and this will be briefed by Jessica Stratton. All right, good afternoon, Council. So yes, this is the Capital Improvement Program, or CIP, which is a six-year program that identifies the large capital expenditures that the city anticipates to make. About two-thirds of it relates to public works. The CIP is updated annually, and this ordinance will amend the Comprehensive Plan's Appendix C to incorporate it. All right, not seeing any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate it. Next ordinance is C36456, relating to a budget planning and budget presentations. This will be briefed by Matt Boston. Yes, thank you. So this is an ordinance uh, amending section 0714030 of the SMC with the intention to uh, continue the uh, currently held strategic budget meetings with um, uh, council and the legis or, I'm sorry, the legislative and executive branches alongside the uh, cabinet members. Council believes that budget challenges will not cease after the passing of the 2024 budget, and this will ensure greater collabor collaboration with, um, within the organization for future years to come. Questions? All right, thank you, Matt. And then you're on here too for a hearing Great. one for possible revenue sources for 2024. Oh, yep, that's just the uh, October 30th uh, rev uh, revenue hearing talking about the uh, the 1% pro property tax increase. And that's setting that hearing for okay. October 30th. Perfect, thank you. Thank so you. that concludes the advanced agenda. Thank you, could we have a motion to approve advanced? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. We're going to move right into our ledge session. And Jacoby and Mr. Jones are going to trade places. Thank you for your work here today. Um, Garrett. As soon as Jacoby comes back, we're going to call the meeting to order. Yes. So I'm going to call the meeting, the legislative meeting to order Spokane City Council for October 23rd. All rise for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right, Ms. Fister, could you do roll call, please? Council President Kinnear. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Ulrich. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. 
Councilmember Wilkerson? Present. Councilmember Zappone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. I'm going to start with open forum. Um, and Mr. Mr. Jacoby Bird is going to read out the names. And we're, we have two minutes. And the same rules apply as of every, every week. Um, so mutual respect and just a reminder that the state law prohibits the use of city facilities, including city council meetings, for the promotion of a candidate for office. So no electioneering in the, in the uh, council chambers. Are you ready? Yeah, uh, we have first on the list is Rachel Callery. Is she online? Oh, here we go. Hello, thank you. First, long time listener, first time appearer. <laughs> um, uh, this month we celebrated White Cane Day, also known in the U.S. as Blind Americans Equality Day. Growing numbers of people are experiencing vision loss for a variety of reasons, including progressive or age-related eye conditions, injuries, or other health conditions. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to walk downtown with Council Member Bingle and with city transportation engineers to demonstrate how infrastructure design contributes to or detracts from accessibility. As you consider legislation that could affect sidewalks, I hope you will consider how to ensure accessible sidewalks, including snow removal strategies. Sidewalk accessibility can be negatively affected by bicycles and scooters on sidewalks. Parked vehicles may block the, the sidewalk or curb ramp entirely. A person with vision loss might not be able to get out of the way of a rider on the sidewalk in time to protect themselves. People with vision loss often have other disabilities, including hearing loss. Having proper bicycle infrastructure and enforcement for riding and parking infractions could reduce these hazardous situations. YK Day is a reminder of the tools and techniques that people with vision loss can use to travel independently and be active and valuable community members. Thank you for doing what you can to promote an accessible community. Thank you. And I know firsthand what that's like right now, so thank you for that. Thank you. Next up, we have Anwar Peace. Good afternoon. My name is Anwar Peace, a Spokane resident and a 23-year police accountability expert. On June 26, the City Council passed a law making it an arrestable offense to be in a park after hours, which 50 days later, a 62-year-old man was brutally and viciously, viciously arrested for being in a park after hours in the valley. Sheriff Sergeant Clay Hilton said he arrested this man because of the law that was passed on June 26 by this council. The sergeant lives across the street from the park and wasn't dispatched. The abuse in the situation was so severe that the jail refused to intake the 62-year-old man. The elderly victim was taken to the hospital with injur injuries of eight broken ribs, a punctured lung, some lip disfiguration, which was caused by the wild punches of the sergeant. No use of force was reported in this situation, neither by the eight deputies or by the hospital staff who serve, saw firsthand this elderly, elderly person's abuse by police. The sergeant was placed on leave 54 days later, and SPD is doing an independent investigation, even though, on average, SPD is the third deadliest police force in the nation due to the same tactics and training these two agencies share, like Killology. The, the Washington Office of Independent Investigation needs to handle this investigation due to the conflicting mutual aid agree agreements with these two agencies. The Valley incident is a canary in the coal mine on this council's recent park legislation, which at the time many community members warned this council about this legislation due to human rights violations and public safety issues, as well as the legislation could be harmful to our homeless neighbors. This Valley situation shows the harm this park law has done to our elders and the police overreach. I respectfully ask that you repeal this parks law. Thank you for your time. Next up is Eugene Knowles, and then David Brookbank online. And Eugene has asked me to share 
Uh, city Council President, uh, City Council members, I was here a week or two ago, and uh, because uh, you can't get too much said in two minutes, I decided to go with a chart. A picture's worth a thousand words, and a chart can be worth 10,000. If you set it up, and all of a sudden you look at it and you start focusing, and think, oh yeah, that's how it works. So here's our chart. The stuff up at the top is some of the political footballs we have around, but the, in dark here, the black, we're talking about housing. Three parts, planning, facilities, and occupancy. Some people take a long time planning. Some people jump down and get stuff built. Some people get uh, operations people in there and it's working. Okay, now the lines here, um, that's supposed to be green under, with navigators in that zero at the top, blue. Green means you got money, you're above and you're doing well. Below green means you have no money. And the blue symbolically means you're underwater. So navigators are people who help people get out. Navigation centers. So you can see the pyramid coming down. People uh, going Eugene, I'm, I'll, I'll pause your time, but could you grab maybe that mic that's mobile or, or stay by the mic and speak into the microphone? Uh, uh, Thank you. The pyramid going down, people go into homelessness one at a time, and as it drops down up a little bit, as, as it drops down, case management, program shelters, that's like UGM, and public shelters, which they don't have here in Spokane. They call it a public shelter. I was homeless for 10 years. I was in over 20 shelters from Billingham all the way around to Birmingham, Alabama in six different states. This thing out here track is not a shelter. It's Camp Hope with a roof over the top. Okay, now, to the bottom. Once you get under the yellow line, you're in trouble. You become a street refugee. That's what people call homeless. They're really street refugees. Because you see- Eugene, could you side, stay over by the microphone? Is my time up? No, if you could just use the microphone, Eugene, so oh, we can- just so walk everybody I'm sorry. Uh, I'll end at this. Once you fall below the red line, you're in deep trouble. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is get a picture. Uh, I'm going to do a couple, three more of these. <clears throat> By December, I'll have the chart in better shape. But Jacoby said he'd pass it out to me members of the council. You kind of familiarize yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, with the idea. And I'll be back in a couple weeks as I upgrade the chart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene. Thank you. Jacoby, can you share this with the council? Yep. And David. I see you online. Go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead. I'm commenting on the limited and, and flawed democracy of what the Spokane City Council calls limited open forum. Um, I appreciate being able to speak tonight. However, on the 9th of October, when without any prior public notice, the council passed its resolution in support of apartheid Israel, two community members were waiting online as I have been tonight and were unable to speak. That's unacceptable and outrageous. I also want to mention that tonight when we called 311 twice to find out about tonight's meeting, they did not know about the 330 meeting and the cancellation of the six o'clock meeting. It was only because of uh, a, a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation contacted me that I'm here tonight. When last week I attempted to sign up to testify by QR, QR code, I received a message stating this QR campaign has expired and I was not able to sign up. I then had to stop what I was doing and go down and sign up in person. The instructions in the published council notice for this meeting say the forum is three minutes participation. Unless you're giving me three minutes, that's another error. The council must get the people's house in order in particular on the details of public participation in the process for which we elected you. Someone from the council should be designated to work with a few citizens to make sure this public participation process works efficiently and can actually be called democratic. Thank you. Thanks, David. And Will Healings. Good evening, my name is Will Hewlings and I live downtown Spokane. So I just wanna, been really frustrated. My blood pressure's just been boiling just the last week. And I'm not sure if you're aware of 
all the crime. You got people coming up here. I hear so much about homelessness. I never hear anybody talking about actual crime and the stuff that's happening downtown. So 16, and I wrote this this morning, 16 hours ago, West 2nd in Elm, stabbing reported, male fled on foot. Two days ago, West Sprague in North Washington, shooting reported. One day ago, West Sprague in North Washington, assault reported with medical request to stage until scene is safe. Four days ago, South Howard and West First reported teen overdose and several people carrying her down the alley. Fire department requesting police assistance. Four days ago, West Riverside, North Wall by the STA bus terminal in the police precinct uh, reported security located a female behind the recycle bins who is overdosing and unresponsive, need medical help. Four days ago near West Sprague in South Stevens, assault reported, reported suspect fled and victim unconscious. This is in my neighborhood. What are you guys going to do about it? I see so much, you know, the, the, the crosswalks that got vandalized. You have two detectives on that. I don't see, I don't hear about that in the news, about people getting assaulted. Where are, where's the detectives in law looking for them? I'm pretty sure they are, but you only want to focus on certain things. And it's disgusting. You guys are elected to do a job, and it doesn't seem like you do. You, man. Who's next? That's everybody. Uh, Terry, you want to go ahead with the consent agenda, please. <clears throat> Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, consultant agreements for geotechnical engineering on-call services for 2024 to 2025 non-federal various neighborhoods with A. Budinger and Associates Incorporated, Spokane Valley, Washington, not to exceed $800,000. B. Geo Engineers Incorporated, Spokane, Washington, not to exceed $800,000. Number two, low bid of Cameron Riley, LLC, Spokane, Washington, for the 2023 street maintenance curb ramps. $1,175,715, an administrative reserve of $117,571.50, which is 10% of the contract price will be set aside, various neighborhoods. Number three, public utility access easement and temporary construction easement with Laytaw Creek Plaza, LLC, in conjunction with the Marshall Road Transmission Main Phase 3, $135,000. Number four, interlocal agreement between the City of Spokane, Spokane Transit Authority, and Spokane County to carry out a grant award from the Federal Transit Administration as part of the Transit-Oriented Development Pilot Project Program. Excuse me. Number five, multiple family housing property tax exemption conditional agreement with Olga and Raysa Fox for the future co construction of approximately four units at parcel number 35081.4515 commonly known as 1222 East Marietta Avenue. Number six, agreement between the city and American Traffic Solutions doing business as Vera Mobility for continued operation of the photo enforcement program, $1,123,800 annually. Number seven, report of the mayor of Penny Nate claims of payments to previously approved obligations including those of Parks and Library through October 16, 2023. Total $7,837,116.72 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $7,319,146.99. B payroll claims of previously approved obligations through October 14, 2023, $9,018,763.70. Number eight, City Council meeting minutes for September 25, October 9, and October 12, 2023. Number nine, set hearing on possible revenue sources for the 2024 budget on October 30, 2023. Number 10, low bid of T. Bailey Incorporated, Anna Cortez, Washington, for the Thorpe Reservoir Project, $5,044,985 plus tax. An administrative reserve of $504,498.50 plus tax, which is 10% of the contract price, will be set aside. Grandview Thorpe Neighborhood. Number 11, one year value blanket renewal with San Diego Police Equipment and Dooley Enterprises for the 2024 Spokane Police Department Ammunition Order, $195,000 for both vendors. Number 12, approval to submit a right-of-way encampment resolution program proposal to the state, which is due on October 25th, 2023. We have two people signed up for testimony, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, this testimony is three minutes. And first up is uh, Mr. Brookbank. Go ahead, David. I unmuted you. Yes, um, this is on the 
I, I, I actually was distracted from what was going on. I don't intend to testify on this one. I was just doing the open, open forum. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? next up is Will Hewlings. Good evening again. My name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown Spokane. Um, what I have to say about this is, I mean, it, it's just sad, you know, reading that, I should pull up my phone real quick, that basically our police department ordered some ammunition, what, 2022? Here it is. So ammunition delivery times are very unpredictable. Some ammunition has delivered, but we are still waiting on 223 deputy or duty ammunition and was told it is still three to four months out. So they're going to be waiting three to four months before they get this ammunition. So the thing that's really infuriating as an American, as a veteran, we're about to go to war, as you guys can see. For the last year, we've been given Ukraine. According to the Department of Defense, ran by Joe Biden and his Democrats, the U.S. has donated 23 million rounds of small arms, that means bullets, to the Ukrainians to protect their people and their country. While in our, in our own country, Spokane, a good example, our law enforcement doesn't have vehicles, they don't have bullets, they don't have everything, but you guys, and I say you guys because you guys vote for these people, they have no problem giving other countries weapons and protecting them while here I feel so unprotected. So I'm for this, I wish it could be more and, you know, I mean, there's so much more I could say about this, but I only have three minutes. But it's just pretty sad. And I, I wish you guys would maybe focus on that. Like, like we say, I, I don't know what else to compare this to, and I always bring up the rainbow sidewalks, but that seems like a big thing that you guys are focused on, you know. You know, it doesn't seem like you're focused on a lot of other things. I mean, in my eyes, and a lot of other people I know. Just read, go on Facebook and read the comments. You guys like posting stuff on Facebook. Go on Facebook and read what people say about our city and about city council. It's embarrassing. Anybody else? No. Nope. Okay. <clears throat> council commentary. Anybody? All right. Sorry, Council President. Yes. Go ahead. I just want to, uh, to uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, we would have proposals and I, I, I want to thank Seek Smith, um, uh, you know, for, for emailing me some, some information on that. And uh, if it's true, uh, we asked for a legal opinion on this, but I don't think we're going to get it in time. Uh, if it's true that we can um, reject the uh, projects individually as they come in, then I can vote for the, uh, for the row uh, funding. Uh, if not, then I'll be voting against it. And so does anybody have any last thoughts on that? Because if so, I might want to take that one separately. That, that is totally up to you. And what would happen is next year, you would have the power to say with three of your council members that you want these taken separately, that you want these projects brought before you separately so you could vote on each one separately. But that would be up to you. I think he wants a legal opinion. Yeah, on yeah. Well, we're, we're, yeah, Can and I? I, we don't have a legal opinion in the room right now, Council Member. Council President. Go ahead. Yeah, Council Member Beagle, I would just say, I, I, from what I have heard from, from Kim and, and Nicolette and others, it sounds to me like there, there is likely that path. And I'm, I'm taking them at their word on that, that that path is likely the, the one that exists and that we would have those options. Obviously, a future council will do what a future council wants to do on that. But as far as us having some input, I, I do, my understanding is that that will come back to us for that input. Nicolette. 
Comment? I just want to be clear, though, that um, the state could fund those items anyway. Correct. Right? And so, um, and so I just want to make sure you understand that. Because, like, you're saying no to whatever the com commerce decides to go ahead and fund may not result in the action of it not being funded. And theoretically, though, commerce, uh, if we were to vote this down, commerce could then fund any projects that they decided were worth funding. Correct. In the NOFA, it says that if uh, the city of Spokane or, or one of the jurisdictions, the county, for example, uh, didn't submit a viable plan by the 25th, that they would go ahead and take that course themselves and fund yeah. it the way that they see fit, which is why I think it's really important that what does make it in the proposal has a really robust set of options, including some things that I do think are missing in so this I, current uh, proposal. My, my frustration over the lack of detail and the fact that we're not going to know more detail until after we vote on it, which I typically am not supportive of, but the fact that we could vote this down and really commerce could do any number of things that we would have zero input on at that point and so we would be giving up even more control, uh, it sounds like, if we went that path. So it's sort of a lesser of evils kind of option um, in my mind, but the better option is to approve it. I do think, I would hope too that depending on the answer that we get from Commerce about the matching funds, that we make best use of that so that we don't leave that money on the table if matching funds are required to receive those funds. But that, again, will be up to, to what they actually end up sending in. Councilmember Bingle, do you have any questions of Nicolette before she goes back to sits down? Yeah, she just brought up the match, which I totally forgot for us to talk about. But the matching funds, my understanding, is there a, is there a limit on matching funds? So the way the NOFA is currently uh, written is such that there is a category identified of about $8.5 million plus um, that is not accessible unless we match. So the commerce commerce would basically be having to make an exception outside of the realm of the NOFA in order for us to actually have it you know, any touch on those funds or have any, anything to do with those funds. That's what I was hoping that would be answered uh, before you guys voted on this and before the project proposal was actually submitted. Uh, but I haven't received that answer yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other council commentary? All right. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the consent? So move approval of consent. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And Terry, let's go on to special budget ordinance, please. Ordinance C36452, amending ordinance number C36345, passed by the City Council December 12, 2022, and entitled An Ordinance Adopting the Annual Budget of the City of Spokane for 2023, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane Government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2023, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage, and declared an emergency in appropriating funds in. American Rescue Plan Fund number one increase appropriation by $391,484 funded from the city's direct allocation of the state and local fiscal recovery fund of the American Rescue Plan Act. Number two, reallocate the appropriation of $4 million previously appropriated for the purpose of affordable housing. Number three, reallocate the appropriation of $1,200,000 previously appropriated for the purpose of mobile medical services. Number four, reallocate the appropriation of $300,000 previously appropriated for the purpose of eviction defense. Number five, reallocate the appropriation of $112,587 previously appropriated for the purpose of administrative support legal evaluation. Number six, reallocate the appropriation of $120,000 previously appropriated for the purpose of a community engagement coordinator. A, of the reallocated and increased appropriation, $6,124,071 is provided solely for homelessness services. And housing local sales tax fund, number one, increased appropriation by $4 million. A, of the increased appropriation, $4 million is provided solely for affordable housing projects. This action arises from the need to provide appropriation authority to fund critical services and accessibilities to the community. Thank you. And we have two people signed up. And uh, first up is Justice for All and then Meg Flatman. Justice, if you could just unmute yourself and go ahead when you're ready. Hello? Hello? Go hey, ahead. we can hear you. Do you want me to share the presentation that you sent uh, me? Yeah, I'm just going to have to tell you next slide since I can't see it. Um, so today I want to talk about how to improve a community and making sure that people thrive and the actions of this mayoral administration and the city council have overall led to the decline to community health. As shown by the mass exodus of people in, from their homes that would have been prevented if the ARPA money was used as intended. 
and staggered only money to a predatory landlord near his son who continues to profit off the city suffering. The same person who's pushing for harsher policies for people he currently stores in a warehouse. Next slide. First, the social determinants of health are the conditions used to see if people are thriving or just surviving. The worst of the uh, social determinants of health, the worst of the outcomes for the population. Next slide. And what we have is a health crisis. If losing your home isn't a surprise that your health gets worse, um, it shouldn't be. Um, as we know that handling, the handling of this housing crisis has been fumbled by not funding anyone to uh, be there to help the prevention aspect of keeping people in their homes. Um, we see additional negative social determinants of health being criminalizing poverty and creating records for those uh, living with low income or unhoused. Next slide. So Spokane's solution is to sweep everything under the rug and uh, when it comes to the failed top-down policies, like this council's failure to use the money to keep people in their home, and by sweeping people under the rug, it means by putting people in, in jail and expanding uh, predatory um, laws against uh, poverty. Um, to revive a community and make communities thrive, we need upward mo mobility. Um, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure you're on the left. Perfect. Uh, meaning that prevention is a key to making sure that there's upward mobility. This was a major aspect of having that prevention. When you look at the money that was not used properly and is being now funneled to the track shelter of failed housing projects, um, we see a lot of that money would have been used particularly, sorry, um, to help. Sorry, I just keep on hearing so much feedback. I don't know if you can, you can help make it so I don't have to hear that. Um, but $1.2 million uh, mobile medical that could have been used to Chaz or other people doing uh, direct outreach to our population. Thank you so much. Um, 300000 for eviction defense uh, that could have been given to the tenants union and other um, housing and renters uh, things. And of course, we could have used the community engagement coordinator to make sure all these things get done and they would need administrative support as well. Um, and the $4 million that is being used that was, should have been uh, put towards affordable housing once again is being funneled to the worst project that we could do, and that is um, funding Larry Stone's warehouse where he stores human beings. Um, the opposite of poverty is justice. We have Brian Stevenson, a community advocate, lawyer, who has done a lot of work to show how to reshape communities. Um, instead of doing a lot of things like uh, punishing uh, people for things. Uh, we don't see any kind of upward mobility from that. Like if you label somebody a criminal, it's uh, harder for them to have access to housing or jobs. <laughs> um, but things that actually do uh, help would be something like education, skill building, supportive services, mental health and substance abuse treatment. And uh, the bigger aspect of what we're missing out on here with this particular ordinance is that the prevention aspect was, was fumbled. It was failed. And we have seen the results of that with the dramatic increase to our unhoused community that has just exploded and not made anything better for Spokane. Justice, um, that's do the not end of your time. Expand the rug. Do not make things work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Megra, I see your hand raised. I think you can unmute yourself. Yes. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. go ahead. Thank you. There are hundreds, if not thousands, more people living in crisis without nightly shelter than there are beds available in shelters. We need these beds. We need the beds at Trent Shelter. They house 350 people. They're almost always full. And we need them run by Jules Helping Hands, who, has overwhelm who was overwhelmingly chosen by a CHHS committee and who has a long history of humane treatment and serving homeless people with dignity. Some of this money tonight that's being appropriated for Trent Shelter was supposed to be used to keep people housed, to make sure that they're not falling down, they're not being evicted, they've got access to medical treatment, and instead these funds are dismissed as being available due to, quote, failed search from the response received. Spokane sends out a request for proposals, RFPs, and when these that aren't necessarily advertised in capacities that people have access to, sometimes they're just sent to 
just sent to uh, newspapers and online, and people don't always know that they're there. But when there's a failed RFP, when there's a failed response, there's so many, and it's so systemic that we need to look at the system and how we're not putting effort into funding things that we don't want to do. Larry Stone bought Trench Shelter Location. He immediately raised rent, and then he refused to sell it to the government. There still is not running water inside for the 350 nightly guests who need to use restrooms and they need access to showers. These beds are very necessary, but reallocating this money some re reallocating this money to prevent people from becoming houseless is short-sighted when we're destroying the entire ecosystem, the entire safety net to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. We can't do one at the sacrifice of the other. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else to sign nope. up? Okay. Council commentary. Go ahead. We are right back where we were last year at this time. Unsure funding, no other options were presented to us. Winter was upon us, and we did not want the people that we could help to be out in the cold. So we funded the track shelter. Here we are again, one-time monies, winter upon us to fund the track shelter to keep our people warm. It is disappointing that we have asked this council for a plan for as long as I can remember, and one has never been provided to us as to really a path forward for our unhoused people. You ask, we asked the council? No, no, we as a council have asked for a plan. Okay. From this day is, okay. what's the administration's plan? How do we go forward? Are there any other options? Have any other options been considered? And we never got that back. I will support this because again, I do not want our people out <laughs> in the cold in the winter months. So I continue to struggle, but it's only one time money and it only gets us through June of next year. There is still a lot of uncertainty as to where we will be going to really help our most vulnerable population. So I will be voting yes for this um, reluctantly, but again, I don't feel I have any other option. Go ahead. Yeah, I. Uh I will not be supporting this. Uh, I, I have committed very strongly to defending 1590, and I believe that this is effectively just using 1590 for a purpose that it was not approved for. Uh, it's just doing it in a roundabout way. Um, and I think if it was, if it was more honest, that's exactly what would be on paper, um, is exactly that. And so um, I'm also committed to not continuing to use one-time funds to balance our budget, and effectively that's what this does. Um, because of this ongoing expense that we have not really identified a plan for funding mm -hmm. into the future. So I, I will not be able to support this tonight. Um, and I think that maintains kind of my consistency and what I've been saying about our budgeting issues as well as how we're funding track. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a, a question for Council Member Cathcart. If you had another alternative to funding track, I, don't, I didn't. I'm open, to, I'm open to a larger conversation, but it needs to be holistic with our larger budget conversation. It cannot continue to be siloed, and that's what this is. Yeah, I think everyone agrees with that, too, that everyone's been very frustrated by that. Um, I, I'll be supporting this because, like Council Member Wilkerson, I don't see an alternative. We've asked, we've talked, we've tried. Um, it was off limits for the first budget discussion. So we can't even talk about homelessness within the budget right now, that this has to be separate. So I think it's been very frustrating and difficult and that we've again been uh, pushing the corner with no alternative options and I think this is about 10 million dollars now of ARPA funding that will have gone to track of the original was it 89 million dollars so over 10 percent of all ARPA money is going to fund track which has no sustainable future no real proven outcomes right now but seems to be taking all the money that could have been to long-term sustainable so solutions. Go ahead. 
I'll just remind everybody it's, I think they're predicting snow tomorrow or Wednesday. And I agree with everybody, we've got to do something to keep people safe. But I think the bigger picture is what's so upsetting to me about this is the lack of conversation, the lack of communication with the administration, and the feeling like, okay, here's the mess, and between staff and city council, you guys figure it out. And I think we could have done a much better job working together and being honest about what we'd like to see in services. But frankly, I don't think um, people inside City Hall um, were ready or willing to listen to either staff or council members who have been talking about this issue of being ready and being prepared to deal with the issue, to provide services, to walk people out of homelessness. It hasn't gotten any better. Um, I don't feel like it. it's not gonna get better this year. So I feel for everybody, I know this is a tough pill to swallow, but we've gotta keep people safe they at least have to have a roof over their head, um, despite the fact that it's a warehouse and it, people should not be living in it. But I don't think we have a lot of choice right now, so I'll be supporting it. Councilmember Bingle. <clears throat> Thank you, yeah, I'll be, I'll be supporting tonight as well, as everybody's brought up. Uh, you know, track is a real challenge for us. Um, it's great to know that hundreds of people will be in the cold and in the snow. And, you know, if we had an unlimited amount of money, nobody would be out in the cold and the snow. And that's just not the reality of the situation. So um, what we have here, opportunity again for this year to, to help some people, and, and I'm, I'm happy to do so. Um, just a quick point of fact, though, I believe Larry Stone did offer to sell us that building. It was just for uh, $8 million. Yes. Go ahead. I think this has been one of the toughest decisions that I've wrestled with in my short time here. Um, my background is in studying homelessness. I visit over 100 shelters across the U.S. and visiting TRAC um, is disappointing. It lacks hope. It keeps people alive, but it does not uh, end the crisis that they're facing. So I will be supporting this today, but it is, it'll keep people alive, it'll keep people warm through the winter, but we have to do better. We absolutely have to. Okay, yeah, I feel like this is Groundhog Day. Um, we've been here before, we've talked, same thing, this conversation, deja vu. We already had this conversation last year and the year before. The year Nothing's before. changed, it's very disappointing. Like all of you, I can't vote to not fund this and have people out in the cold. I, I wouldn't sleep at night. And I am really wanting something better for our community because this isn't even doing the job. Even with this 350 people in that shelter, there are more people that have no place to go. We absolutely have to do better. So I will be supporting it, but um, not happy about it. Prepare to vote. Aye. Thank you. All right, we are at the end. We have no emergency ordinances, no resolutions, no final reading ordinances, no first reading ordinances, no special considerations, and no hearings. So we will see you next week, October 30th, at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.